For many in the U.S., participation in competitive sports ends on the high school football field. But for Jerry Cicerath and Tino Papavian, football was only the beginning. Rugby, a sport that has long been popular in the Asia-Pacific region, is steadily gaining a following in America, and it became a competitive outlet for Jerry and Tino. What started off as a hobby has taken the two men around the world, competing in international matches, finding a community, and in the case of Tino, bringing them back to his ancestral homeland as a member of the Lao national team. No, it was awesome. I mean, I, I don't I don't have the best Lao. I can understand it more than I can speak it. So, and then also in rugby, rugby is like, it's, rugby is a language by itself too. So all you need to do is like, you make eye contact, you know, you just, you just make, you know, hand signals and stuff like that. And they understand what you're doing, what they're saying. So, you know, it was great, you know, and they, and then a lot of them are like my really actually close friends. We talk, you know, through Google, we talk just like through our broken English or my broken Lao. And yeah, I know it was I, it was awesome, and then again, I think I I think I told you like the I think the main person who runs Lao um Lao Rugby the Lao, Lao Rugby Federation um is an American Megan Knight. She used to I think she played for a club in um Glendale, Colorado, and I I don't know how like how she got to Lao since she stayed there, but she's there, she lives there, hmm. and she's like kind of running the running the whole like federation from over there. Oh, I wonder if she was part of that XO program or something. Oh yeah, I don't know. Yeah, that could be it too. Or I mean, what what's the XO program? Uh, so the XO program was actually like kind of a USA Rugby experimental. Um, it's pretty much the transition program where they pretty much look for all your uh, NCAA collegiate athletes at large, pretty much, kind of hmm. after the, either they get cut from a football team or something, and try to turn them into rugby players, pretty much. Hmm. So that was the yeah um, Colorado XO program. Oh, okay, yeah, that's yeah. pretty. What, cool. what year? What year did they were they trying to do that? Ooh, I'm not sure if it's still ongoing. I want to say they started uh, 2019. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it's very recent. Yeah, I know. I know Megan was has been there for like like way close to 10 years now. So. Yeah, I mean, that could be it too, but like I know there's a lot of expats who like who stay in Laos or in Thailand, so there's like that little bit like connection do there. I mean, I mean, I've there's been countless people who's, who I've met in Laos who like they go to Laos and just don't come back, you know. <laughs> so. <laughs> yep. Yeah. It's another pace of life, right? So. I mean, I, I went I went to Thailand last December and I didn't want to come back. So I mean, it's it's a difference. It's definitely a different. It's a different life out there, man. It's a different. It's a different vibe, different peace altogether, man. It's just, I don't know. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I wouldn't mind like, you know, I you know I've seriously thought about like just moving back or just uh, not moving there, just because like it's just different. And also like, I mean, I also just grew up like not being around, let alone any Asian people or any Lao people. So it's just like it's kind of cool to be around like people that are like you. Yeah, you, yeah. which is you know. It's very real. It's a, you know, it's, a, it's a different culture, man. It's a different yeah. culture, like versus the Western world, right? It's a different pace. It's different values. Uh, the cost of living is a lot, <laughs> a lot <Yeah>. cheaper. Food, <laughs> yeah. food did, is you know amazingly cheap. Did your language come back really quick, Tino? Like really improve quick when you were oh, there? Oh yeah, absolutely. Like yeah, my, yeah, yeah. My parents told me like when I was growing up here, they would say like you only spoke Lao when you were a kid. And when you start getting more into like the obviously the the American schools with you know people who speak English, you just lose that language. But then, like when I went back to Laos in middle school, when this is what it wasn't even for rugby, I like I it all came it almost all came yeah, back. Yeah, it, it's funny because I was in Italy and I noticed after about a week because I had some language exposure through my family, it just hockey sticked. <laughs> you know, first yeah. you're like uh, you don't know nothing, and then it starts. It just it's it's kind of cool from that regard. So that's awesome. Yeah, well, you Jerry, have right. you been back to Laos? Uh, back in 2000, my mom, uh, I went oh, okay. with my mom to go visit and been missing it ever since. She's actually recently been trying to go back. Um, but we obviously with the whole COVID situation, we've just been telling her to hold off because yeah. we don't want her building uh, vacation days in quarantine. So we're going to try and wait till that clears up a little bit. Yeah, uh, I'll be there in a couple of weeks. It's open now for business. Tourism's yeah. back. 
uh, no COVID quarantines. So nice. yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be great, man. So. All right. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of C4 podcast. My name is coach and I'm here with my co-host, John Messina, and we have an awesome guest lined up for tonight. Uh, if you guys haven't already, please uh, like follow, share our page. Uh, we have a, uh, Facebook page, Lao American Sports, uh, C4 Podcast. Um, on IG, we're Lao American Sports. And uh, we're also on YouTube, Spotify. Um, just, you know, give us a like, uh, comment, give us a share, recommend us to uh, your friends, family, or, or hey, if you know of any great Southeast Asian athletes, we'd, we'd love to hear, hear about them, you know. So anyways, without further ado, let me uh, have take give it over to John so he can introduce our guest. Yeah, so we have an exciting guest today. He is a rugby player, Tino, coming to us out of the Seattle area. And with that, Seattle folks, please do us a favor. Visit Sweet Rice Lao Thai Eats. It's owned by our good friend, um, Rob Saisana. He has two locations, one in Auburn, one in Tacoma. He is helping us out with a lot of things behind the scenes, in particular with our Sea Games Athlete Initiative. Rob's part of that team, so we'd appreciate if you would patronize his business. And with that, our Sea Games athlete um, fundraiser continues. Um, it'll be going on through the end of the games, which ends on May 17th. We wanted to first thank everybody. We're really humbled and overwhelmed by the support the community's given us. We reached 75% of our goal um, in just a short time of promoting it. So thank you so much to everybody who supported that. We're really making history over there by sending a group of these Lao American athletes back to Laos to compete with the national team at the SEA Games in Cambodia. It is going to be an exciting and great time. Um, so with that, one of the athletes that we have on today, Tino here, actually has represented Laos um, in the rugby competition. So it's kind of nice to have him on right before my own daughter goes over there to do something very similar. Um, so with that, um, Tino, um, before we even dive into the interview, maybe just introduce yourself, tell everybody your full name. And rugby is extremely popular in certain countries, England, Australia, New Zealand, the whole Pacific region, Polynesian islands, et cetera. But in the U.S., to be honest, I, there's not a lot of people that play it. There aren't really a bunch of pro leagues and things yes. like that. So people probably don't even know what the sport is. So if you could, maybe you know, tell everybody what it is, a little bit of the history and how you play it. Yeah, um, so I'll introduce myself. Um, and also thank you, John and Cole, for having me on the podcast. Um, my name is Tino Bapavion. I'm also from Seattle. My parents are from Laos, um, Tasno, Savannah Kit Laos. Um, yeah, I know um rugby is a it was the predecessor of football. It's a free flowing sport. I guess like the um the only sports that are that are just related to it is football and soccer. You pass backwards, you pass laterally. You can kick forward. You um, you can kick forward to advance the ball. You can run forward to advance the ball. There's um, it's an ongoing clock. The only time this stops or is when there's an injury, injury like a head, a head trauma, or um, um, yeah, and then and or, or just injuries in general. Um, I'm pretty sure I, I know, I know my friend's gonna kill me this, but I think it originated from the UK or England. Um, yeah, and rugby, it's just it's not it's it's still like um. I think uh, maybe probably a couple of years ago, it was like the fastest growing sport in America, but it's still very niche in the sense like, again, like we still have like the Kings still football, baseball and basketball, et cetera. Um, but at least in my area, um, rugby has, you know, is very popular. Um, there, there is like, there is a, um, a pro league now, the MLR major league rugby. Um, before that, there was a lot of like um, amateur leagues or, or just failed pro leagues. Um, for whatever reason, there probably wasn't, maybe there wasn't, it wasn't run right or it wasn't the pop, like the popularity didn't catch on, but now it seems like it's catched on very well. And, um, and yeah. So it's actually Here. popular in Seattle. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, it's very popular in Seattle. And I would say it's popular in like California, Texas. Um, I know more of the East coast States, um, New York, Connecticut, like the more upper Northeast it's, it's pretty, it's popular there. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and then again, like there are there, there is like a a pro league, the MLR. Um, there are teams in Texas, California, um, Seattle, um, the East Coast, and 
even the South. So it's it's getting um it's getting up there in popularity. So here's my question, like rugby, and you mentioned like. Yeah, it's not as big as like football, baseball. When you look at football, baseball, let's say gymnastics, martial arts, they always seem to uh, allow you know, people to start at a very young age, right? I mean, you can do pee wee when you're young, you do baseball when you're young. Yeah. Uh, does rug does rugby start like that? Like from the UK and Australia, that's where it's from. Do they have uh, like an age where kids start start say, hey, I mean, I want to I want to play rugby. Like, how old are you? when you said you wanted to pursue rugby. Yeah, cool. And that and that's like for me, it's different because um kind of going off like they're um and rugby is like a main it's one of the main sports in other countries. Like I know one of my teammates I used to I used to play for, they played since it was three or four years old. Okay. Okay. So it's the same thing as like in the in you know in America, we start playing football at like a very young age, like the peewee leagues, like and salsa right. baseball, basketball. I for me football or sorry excuse me rugby was a very secondary sport I didn't pick it up until I was a senior in high school oh okay yeah okay and you played you played some high school football right yeah I played high school football at um at Mount Sai um didn't really have an alternative afterwards like I I think I told you guys on the chat that I was um the only interest I had was probably division three football and then even then though it was just kind of like I think I was I'd done at that point <laughs> So I didn't know if I was like really to make that jump and yeah. And then my, my best friend and my roommate now, he um introduced me to rugby um in high school. And then even then, like um in 2011, it wasn't it wasn't really as popular as it now. But um Seattle was kind of was a little bit of a hotbed for rugby. So I got kind of um it was good for me to pick it up in Seattle and got get to learn the sport over over here. So I mean, how did you go about that? So it wasn't like wasn't available in high school, right? It was like a, just an organization that you went to and said you wanted to learn or you wanted to be a part of a team. Were there tryouts? How, how did, what was the process of that, of, of getting, of starting for you? At least when I was going, um, when I was playing in 2011, yes, no high school in general had like a, like a club team, like, oh, sorry, had a team. <laughs> like my, like these individual high schools won't have like a, um, a rugby team. It would be like, a, it's a club sport. So you would you would join like, like it'd be a, a congregate of like different um players from an area that would play for this club. So I played for the East Side Lions and that was um the east side of Seattle that represented okay. that or anyone who would join. So um I, I don't know what it is, I don't know what it is now particularly, but I just know it's ten times more popular than it is now than it was back in the day. And how I got into it was just again, my friend just, hey, do you want to play rugby? I play for this club team. And again, I was like, that's, I was like, I didn't know what it was. So I was like, is it close to football? I was like, yeah, it's, you know, tackling. I was like, oh yeah, sure. I like to tackle. So it just worked out that way. And and then I was also a lineman, so I didn't get to run with the ball. He's like, well, the cool thing about rugby is anyone can run with the ball. So <laughs> that was pretty cool for me to, like, you know, that was a cool concept for me to even grasp or understand. Wow. That's exciting. So you pick it up with this club um, when you're, you know, kind of your late teens there. Tell us mm -hmm. how your rugby career kind of progressed. Where'd you go from there? Yeah, so I um, so at the time um, I played for the East Side Lions, and then um, in in Washington State there was only one college team that was really um that was pretty good at rugby, and that was Central Washington University. And I was talking to the coach there to go play rugby over there, um, but my grades weren't really up to par to what their standard was, or I just or yeah, my grades weren't really there. So I went to community college. So my alternative was to go straight into like to play for a senior men's team. And then senior men's team in Seattle was Seattle Rugby Club. And also at the time, there was a team that played in like what they would call the professional leagues or semi-professional at the time was um, Old Peaches Sound Beach. And I think at the time, the league was called a Super League. So I went to go play for a men's team first before I went to go college or um, play for a college team. And that was pretty cool. And also very like intimidating because I was, um, I didn't turn 18 yet. I was still 17 playing for a, um, a men's team. So you could kind of, you can probably like kind of predict what I was kind of going through with like all like the, like grown men and I'm just playing with them. And it's like, Oh, this is kind of cool and kind of crazy at the same time. Well, t tell us about that and tell us about, Okay, not only were you young, but you were also you were also the ocean, right? I'm I'm thinking rugby, not too many, and you know, at that time in Seattle, 
There yeah, weren't too no, many playing. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, um, at the time, I didn't even know Laos played rugby. Um, you know, or there was any Laotian players who, you know, who even existed, or even I would even say like back in the day, I didn't even know there was any Laotian athletes in general because I was just, I was, um, my parents always told me like there wasn't just a lot of kids who come to America and like. When you're like an immigrant kid, like you know, um, kids were like playing sports, I guess that's what they told I'm sorry, me. I'm sorry. I, had, I got to laugh at that because like that's that's what my family thought about me when I when I told them I wanted a bodybuilder. It's like we don't play sports, man. Go to go to school, get an education, and whatever you know, get a family. Yeah, you know? no. So yeah, it was it was what was crazy about that um with that experience was I um it was like almost a miracle in the sense, like I fell in with like one of the best clubs in the country, like in, in, in terms of quality and also just like, just great people. Like um, the people I've met, the coach there at the time, Kevin Flynn, um, great, great coach. He, you know, took me under his wing. He, under his wing, he would help me out with any kind of like, um, you know, just like kind of navigate just being an adult as well. And as well as playing in a, like a proper rugby club. So it was it was fun and I wouldn't take it back. Like I think I get asked a lot, like, hey, would you rather play like imagine if you went straight to college and played rugby? And I was like, Yeah, it would be fun, but like I wouldn't take back playing with these, you know, a lot of my friends now who are full going adults and they were just it was awesome, you know. Um and at the time we were we didn't um the league we were we would play in is we would play in the Canadian league rather than a league that's in America. So every almost every other weekend we would travel to Canada and play teams in Canada. So that was a really cool experience for me. So yeah. was that like playing when you mentioned Canada? So is it an outdoor sport or is it indoor? Cause I, I figure it's gotta, it's gotta be cold up in Canada, right? Or even no, it's, in- it's very much outdoor sport. Yeah. I don't think I've, I've seen people play in domes and stuff, but it's just, you play rugby outdoors. Correct. Yeah. I've never seen, I've seen, you know, again, like oh. excuse my ignorance, but I've, you know, I know very little about rugby, but I've barely ever seen like a rugby match where it's in the snow. Like you obviously football, you know, in the they're playing in the blizzard and all that stuff. I just don't ever recall yeah. seeing any type of highlight video of, of rugby and like you know they're playing in the snow. Oh yeah, no, they play in the snow. It's um, human learning is pretty. It's pretty bad. It's pretty shitty playing in the snow <laughs> in the rain. It's really, it's it's really bad. <laughs> I don't yeah, know. yeah. It, well, it's, it's, a, it's fun. It, it's fun for the spectator, right? I mean, it's cool for the fans. Yeah, I mean, if you're watching in that like, negative, like yeah. cold, like in freezing weather, like I, yeah, like playing in Seattle and then playing up in Vancouver, BC, or even more north, we would go to Kamloops sometimes, and it would just be dead cold, windy, and we were just like we question ourselves, like my God, what are we doing here playing rugby? But it's like it's it's, it's a fun sport. So it was yeah, no, we played in all weathers and we play outdoors and yeah, no, in most of my time, like in Seattle, it rains, so we played in the rain and in the mud. Oh, okay, yeah, that I've seen. That I've seen. Yeah. Was you know, was it kind of a shock for you from the standpoint of you're 17, now you're basically on the field with men and kind of an aggressive sport. There's gotta be just like trash talk and insults and or or no, I mean, tell me, was it a shock yeah, from no, that standpoint? It's, I mean it's it's a I mean in rugby, I I it was such I think for me um was it's just a different culture than what was football. Oh. Like yeah, we would tra- we would I mean, yeah, there's trash talking and then there's times it's like it's it is crazy because when you when I was 17, 18, um I was also playing with like international players as well. Like some Seattle, like the Seattle team had a, a good amount of players who play who are um who were, you know, up there who were used to play professionally overseas or they were um they were USA Eagles, which is the team, the rugby team that they that represents the the states. And um it was really crazy. And then when you're 17 and you're getting thrown into a match with the grown grown ass man and they're running straight at you and you're expected to tackle them. It's like, wow, this is the real deal in the sense of like, you know, you're expected, you're, you're, you're just thrown in there. You're expected to make the tackle. You're expected to, you know, to play as hard as everyone else. Like, I think the crazy thing for me, was like, yeah, I was a kid, but they expected me to do everything as a, what a man would do on the field. That's cool. So you played, start with that club and what, did you move into college next? Was that what you did? No, I think um, I school I, school wasn't for me, so I figured that out like kind of through hours. Like, school wasn't for me, so I, I just at the time I just I stayed with um with Seattle Rugby the whole time. Um, um, I played yeah I played I think I played at least like eight 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 nine years with Seattle Rugby. Oh wow, yeah exciting. yeah. Um, and then um, I was still at the time I was still going to community college, just taking a couple classes, 
And um, one of my coaches got me a child to go a child to play for the collegiate um, all Americans, which is all the all the college college players um, um, in the states. And um, I made the team, and I played. Um, we played some traveling. We played um, Cambridge University in um, in Boston. And we also played a um, a provincial team. Uh, uh, excuse me, a provincial team from Canada. So that was a really fun experience there as well too so I, I yeah my whole career was playing for seattle and then i also played for the collegial americans and then also i think i told you guys before the the podcast i played for a um a team called the dac wear dragons and they're a team based out of chicago and hong kong and we travel through asia and play tournaments over there what what is a dac is that what is that i think that's like I think that's a company that was um my um my coach or my my manager like that was the company named DAC and then oh, it was DC, just like okay. our mascot yeah gotcha gotcha mm-hmm. well tell us a little about that tryout I mean what were they looking for uh what type of skills did you have to show I mean what, what were you trying to what were yeah what what were they looking for when you you know doing a tryout yeah I would assume it's the same thing like you're they're looking for a you know um they're looking for just um rugby players who are just who are good i guess like in a sense like um i would say it's like it's re- the good the best college teams in america can could compete with the best um club teams um men club teams in america which is like a weird concept to like kind of like juggling your mind because you would think like oh men um men like the senior level rugby players in the usa are obviously better than men than the college teams but some of these college teams are um they recruit from like um they recruit the best players in America and they also recruit um out of the country as well. So I I think I remember like half the team that um that made that collegiate all American team that in my year, half of them weren't even from America. Hmm. So it was like I was playing with guys who played rugby their whole lives. And then there was like some guys who just picked up rugby like me. I didn't pick it up until like my senior year of high school. So it was like there there was a um it was I'm not sure you mean, but it was easy to cut off the good players from the, the not so good players there. So yeah, I mean, there's like again, there's certain skills you have to have, certain physical attributes you have to have in the sense of like, um, how you deal in the contact zone, which is how you tackle. Are you willing to tackle? Are you willing to um, are you willing to basically give up your body in a certain way that some players aren't? Mm. So, Tino, thanks for giving us your background. We are now joined by another Lao American rugby rugby player, Jerry, here. So what we're going to do is Jerry's going to go ahead, introduce himself, tell us a little bit about his background from Laos and how he ended up getting into rugby. So, Jerry, welcome. Hello, everybody. Um, let's see. Early rugby career um, really started hey, Jerry, out. Like, Jerry, yeah. Jerry, why don't you start? Let's, let's start with your name. Let's go with full name and where you're born and all that good stuff. Uh, my name is Jerry Lee Sisrath. I was born in Roseau, Minnesota, so northern Minnesota boy. Okay. Um, quite a good law community up there. Uh, grew up playing American football just like everybody else. Uh, always been sports, you know, I, you know, sports related growing up. Just it's just what we did when we were little. Um, and then, then after high school, I decided to join the Air Force. While in the Air Force, they had intramural sports, which was flag football. There was no contact. Uh, and then found my way to stationed in Albuquerque, where I was still playing intramural sports and flag football. And then had one of my teammates kind of see me all hot-headed from a guy talking smack. And he asked me, he's like, hey, man, you want to hit that guy? He's like, yeah, I'd like to. He's like, come, pl- come join me playing rugby. I was like, all right. So he brought me out and I started playing rugby and then uh, it was around 2012, uh, started my first game. And after that, it was end of story, the start of my uh, rugby career out of Albuquerque playing with the New Mexico Brujos. Uh, that was my rookie year and my first year playing rugby ever and just fell in love with it. And I wish I had started it earlier. That way I would have had a little more um, rugby foundation to begin with. But good thing I had a uh, football background, so the transition wasn't too terrible. It was actually pretty easy with the, the football background. And then uh, after staying in Albuquerque for, for six years, I was there from 2008 to 2015. 2015 is when I got stationed in Japan. 
and I played in I got to play in Japan for three years with the Tokyo Crusaders, which uh, if anybody knows rugby, uh, rugby in Japan is very technical. And when everybody found out when I told the team that I was going to Japan to play rugby, uh, you know, in along with my service time there, um, they told me get ready and have fun because I will definitely learn a lot and my game would improve there which was very true. Um, during my time there in Japan from 2015 to 2018, uh, I was able to link up with the rugby community in the Pacific, um, got picked up by a coach out of Okinawa to join him for the 2016 uh, All, All Pacific Warriors team. Uh, we then on, went on to the LA or not, Las Vegas Sevens tournament and brought the pretty much Pacific Select team out to Vegas to play pretty much uh, what were the pro teams before pro rugby came along. Uh, I mean, we got to play against like Chicago Lions and a couple other big name men's rugby teams at the time. And then after that, I went back to Japan to continue the rugby career in Japan, won a couple Tokyo Cup championships with uh, Tokyo Crusaders out there. And then 2018, I landed in Tucson rugby and it's where I've been playing ever since and then uh 2021 i got selected to go represent the air force with the men's sevens team so that was a pretty awesome experience and something i'll never forget it's probably the highest level of rugby i'll ever play and i definitely enjoyed my time there and that's uh after that that year i decided my body has had enough i couldn't play at that level for too long so i just came back to men's rugby and that's where I'm at now, still currently with the uh, Tucson Magpies. And uh, we're getting geared up here in a couple of weeks. We're finishing out our regular season and heading into playoffs. So okay. that's kind of been my rugby journey so far. So when you played in Japan, um, was this made up of other military officers and so forth? Or was it a from local Japanese people? And then would you play in other countries around Japan? Or how did that work? Uh, so it was... You know, obviously rugby rugby is a very niche sport. Uh, you only know about it if you know about it. Yeah. And uh, so it was primarily uh, Japanese locals and then foreign expats out there. So there, uh, I got exposed to a lot of Fijian play, uh, a lot of Kiwi play, which New Zealanders, and then uh, a lot of British and Aussies. So and even folks from all the way from Argentina. So playing with the Tokyo Crusaders, you kind of got exposed to literally. Uh, rugby from all over the world uh, and then mind you um, the union that the Tokyo Crusaders play in is pretty much a feeder to the top league teams so we had a bunch of guys come through uh, that pretty much uh, they came to us and got their you know feet on the ground in Japan and then they got fed up into the top league of Japan so that was pretty fun and then some teams that we played against in the Japan Union also had uh, Jap Japan national level players on the opposing teams, which was some pretty stiff competition. Mm. And you could definitely tell the uh, difference in skill level. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's pretty cool. Um, and then the, the air force sevens team. So that was a team made up of all military people pretty much. Yeah. So each branch has their own uh, sevens team. Sevens is what the armed forces is currently uh, running as the men's rugby format. Uh, there are a couple uh offshoots of 15s because 15s is what they used to run uh, but sevens has been the mainstay since uh, it is now olympic sport again uh, and a uh, couple uh, i think army has had a couple guys on that national team to represent the u.s so army has been pretty prominent in the armed forces on feeding the national team but yeah sevens uh, is current the format and yeah that's that's where it's at Okay. Well, that's cool. Well, so you brought up something that, that's got our interest here with Tino, that there's national teams, Olympic sport. Tino's had the honor of playing on the Lao national team and playing in Laos. So Tino, we're going to jump back to you. Tell us how you ended up um, playing in Laos and what your experience was like there. Yeah. Um, I think when I was, I think when I was 19, I wasn't, um, I was still very new to rugby and then I was just um, looking up on YouTube, just like, Lao rugby I looked it up and I didn't know they had a team and they 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 had a team um and at the time obviously I was still very new to rugby and I was trying to just focus on my game a bit 
And obviously, when you play in, in the United States, you want to play for the USA Eagles. So that was just kind of, I didn't even think about playing, you know, for Laos until like probably a couple years forward. Probably after I made the Collegian All Americans, and I find out, and I started just like think to myself, like rugby is like, like it's just a, it's just a fun sport for me. You know, it's not like it's not things really gonna go with it with me at a professional level. So I hit up, um, I I hit up the Lao Federation, um, rugby foundation over there, and um, that's how it kind of all started. And then um, um, the team, the traveling team I play for, the the Wear Dragons, one of their main sponsors, um, is the person who owns the Wear Dragon or who is the manager of the Wear Dragons. So they got me connected because um, the Wear Dragons is basically like a team that does like does work with the Lao national team as well and recognizes players from around the world who want to play for Laos or just want to have experience to go back to Laos. So yeah, playing for um my first time playing for Laos was um I played um with them probably like five, six years ago and we played against Indonesia and um and and Thailand. And um it was a really cool experience. Like it was um it was awesome because I got to meet some of the um obviously domestic Lao players who are just I mean, there are a bunch of dogs out there and like, they're just awesome. Like raw athletes, like they just want to have fun and just, and they're, they're just, they, they're just like really cool people. And then what was also really cool is I got to meet some other players, um, some, I guess, export Lao players who are not from Laos. So I got, you know, there was players from New Zealand, Australia, um, UK and France. And it was a, it was a really fun time. I got to spend a lot of time in Laos. Then I got to play in Bangkok or not Bangkok. I don't know exactly where I was in Thailand, but it was outside of Bangkok. And that was a really, really fun time. Got to, got really close to the culture as well. I got a question for both of you. I'm like, you know, who, I mean, go ahead and answer whoever wants to answer first. But obviously it sounds like you guys were able to, you know, travel the world right, and play this um, and play rugby. Was it, were you financing it? Like, through your own or were you getting paid a good amount of money to play i mean how i mean is it like other like you know is it like football while well, you're making you know millions or i mean how, how was like the salary for for rugby um so my experience was it's uh rugby is very grassroots so a lot of it is out of pocket to the players uh if you get lucky yeah you might have someone sponsor um uh, when i when we traveled from overseas to uh, Las Vegas in 2016, we actually had a sponsor that, you know, tipped us in some money for that trip. Um, but like a lot of the other trips have been, yeah, just funded by the team and personal expenses from my experience. Gotcha. Yeah. For me, when I was traveling overseas to play rugby for Laos and stuff, it was, um, I was very fortunate. It was, um, all it was, a lot of it was funded by the, the Lao team or, or our sponsors as well, like the DSC Word Dragons. So I was just very fortunate to have someone tr- cover for my travels, my food, and and um all that stuff. Like like Jerry said, like rugby at least at least in America is very like it's is on uh, grassroots. So it's like you anywhere in America, you almost have to pay for it yourself. Yeah. So any chance, Tina, you know, Sean Johnson will be joining the Lao national team anytime soon? Oh, yeah. I think um, he visited Laos, um, like, I think, like, four years ago. And I saw him there. And I was like, hey, we could really use you. <laughs> oh, did you see him? No, I, I personally oh, didn't see him. No, I saw yeah, him, like, yeah, I was yeah. in America. And I, watched, and I saw the videos. And I was like, man, imagine if we could play with Sean Johnson. Um, no, nah, I think, I mean, he's already having a career. Obviously, he's out a career. Yeah, and yeah. He's even playing rugby league. So, I mean, that'd be great, though. So for those who don't know who he is, um, he's born in New Zealand. His mom's from Laos. He's one of the best players in the world, and he's a professional player. Uh, plays in Australia, I believe, on a team there with, where rugby is just huge. And there's a great documentary on YouTube that his brother Joe, who we've talked to, has put up. Uh, we'll put a link in the show notes. Any Everybody should watch it. It's about his family going back and kind of discovering their Lao roots um, and and some rugby stuff in there too. So great documentary by him for sure. So, well, well, that's, that's, that's kind of cool. So, um, Tino, so you, you kind of ended your, your overseas playing, um, let's kind of wrap up your career before we kind of talk about the sport in general. So what are you doing now? What do you, who are you playing with now? Yeah. So I think I've, I kind of stopped playing rugby actually. I think, oh. um, 
yeah, well, I think what Jerry like what, what Jerry was saying, like the body can't really take it anymore. Yeah, I mean, you end up like you, you know, I just me personally, like I just um, rugby is a sport that's like you play mostly on the weekends, like and at least domestically, you all you play on the weekends, and I just um with me traveling to Canada almost every other weekend or in some cases every weekend to go play rugby it was just like a bit too much for me I kind of wanted my weekends back a bit and just also again it's like it's tough on the body I broke my jaw and I broke my ribs playing rugby and I just kind of don't want that anymore I can't really afford it too so (laughs) um, yeah yeah, so I'm 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 done playing rugby but I still like I still play for the Were Dragons if um like this last summer they had they were playing in a tournament in Chicago and they asked me to come out and I played with them. And then I think we, I think we, we are, we might be traveling back to Laos to go play in the Vientiane um, rugby tens over there. So if that ends up being the case, I will, you know, I get ready for that. I'm just not playing every weekend or, just, you yeah. know, not to focus on it. But if it's playing for Laos or playing for the World Dragons, going to travel, I'm, I'm on it. I am definitely on it. Yeah, what that's... question about Laos? Is there like a is there like a league consisting of like of a bunch of teams, or is it just one Lao national team that plays other countries? Yeah, so from what I know, there's um, I don't think there is like a like a a set league. They do have like different teams there. I know they have um, they have I think they have maybe two or three like set teams that play, but there's no like real like lead a place every weekend or a schedule to play every weekend they'll play the tournaments like in in um in bangkok or when they have them in 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 Vientian. but um other than that there is like a national team men's and women's but oh, there's women's too yeah I, 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 I will say this about them and Lyles, me, like, oh. the Lyles, like they focus more on the women's team it's it's awesome like the team oh. over there the women's team really the, it's 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 phenomenal they have, oh. they have some really great players over there and they um they're getting especially the kids the kids too they're getting a lot of the kids especially the girls to get play to play rugby or just be exposed to just sports in general, so the people at um at the Lao Rugby Federation um Megan Knight um over there who runs it is they're just doing a, an awesome job just getting kids into it. Uh, that's <clears throat> that's cool to hear because like earlier on you had mentioned you know like you had never heard of any Lao athletes, right? Yeah, I mean, no, again, sure, yeah. I mean, me growing up, man, it was all about education, education, education. And uh, it's cool to, to see, like, you know, Laos is, again, that's why we created, you know, we created the Lao American Sports Hall of Fame was to recognize athletes from Laos because nobody knew, you know, to be honest, nobody knew. Or very few people knew. I shouldn't say nobody. But, I mean, people just didn't know about, man, this person or that person or this sport, that sport. And that's cool to hear. That's really cool to hear. Yeah. Well, cool. So Jerry, you're, you're, you're getting close to retirement here, right? So what, what's next for you in the way of sports when you hang up your rugby? I don't know if that's a, uh, it's well, not a hat, but. Uh, I've already started coaching. I also coach uh, the high school. I help coach the high school team out here in Tucson, the Tucson Blackbirds. Oh. Uh, we were only uh, back-to-back state camps the last two years. So. Oh yeah, you know, we kind of got a good thing going, and um, that's pretty much what I naturally transition into is a coach, at least for the high school team. Uh, after this this season, it's my retirement season. I'll, I'll probably end up uh, assisting with the men's team that I play for right now as well, too. So, yeah, the body is definitely tired, uh, and I I still play hockey myself too. So that's a little bit easier than uh, rugby. Okay. I don't think I ever heard of a Laotian hockey player, man. Well, I mean, Minnesota, right? I mean, that's where you grew up. So I guess that's yeah. pretty cool there, huh? Yeah, if you look up World, it's a, it's a pretty famous small hockey town. A lot of hockey players come through there, and that's where I grew up. And, uh, you know, all my uncles, my older uncles, they all played and stuff. So, yeah, it was, it was something you don't hear about, you know, normally in the Asian, the law community. So, yeah, a lot of yeah, people play yeah. hockey over we know how to skate and play hockey up there. So uh, again, man, that's why we, you know, why we, me and John are doing this, man, just to bring awareness, man. Like, I mean, I, that's my first time ever hearing of a late ocean hockey player, man. So that was pretty cool. Yeah. Well, um, before we kind of get to the parting advice from you guys, Jerry, we'd love to hear a little bit about your military service. First of all, thank you for that. I know you spent quite a bit of time in the air force. Um, maybe tell us a little bit about, um, your non-rugby military service. Uh, non-rugby military service. Uh, let's see. Um, came in September 2005 is when I first joined. 
uh, uh, my first station was in North Carolina. Then from there, I went on to Albuquerque, which is where I started rugby. And then obviously I went to Japan after that and then ended up in Tucson, which takes me up to uh, until today. So that's been my career. I've been deployed three times. Uh, been all over the Pacific due to me being in Japan for the three years. So I got to fly all over there. Uh, that was also gave me an opportunity to play out in New Zealand as well, too. So a little bit of a rugby in there, but, um, but yeah, uh, the services take me all over the world. Uh, I'm a aircraft maintenance by trade, uh, engine specialist on C-130s. And, um, yeah, I've been enjoying and definitely taking all the t- opportunities that has given me. Uh, I've still been trying to get, uh, onto the Lao assignments to help, help them, uh, go recover, uh, falling Vietnam, uh, war fighters from that era uh there's still uh mission missing in action folks so uh, the u.s military is still trying to recover uh human remains uh out mm-hmm. in Laos. so i've been trying to get on that mission uh, but uh mm-hmm. unfortunately i don't know how to read and write i can speak because obviously i still speak you know with the family and stuff but i didn't ever learn how to read and write which is something i regret because if i knew how to do that i would be on those missions right now helping trying to get those people back so you, wow. you can get on that online class that me and John took. Yeah. So I mean, so, was... <laughs> shout out to Sydney um, from Let's Learn Lao. Co co talked me Sydney, into taking Sydney a Lao and Jorno. class. Sydney I, and Jorno. I, I I finished last in the class. Co finished first. <laughs> I don't know um, <laughs> it's cool, so, man. It's was, it was pretty cool to learn, man. If you guys ever you know do get a chance and take a class, man, just uh, you know, even just learn the alphabet and learn how to put words together was was pretty cool. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm going I, I over there. Question, I got a question like, uh, what would what would you say the average height and weight of a rugby player is, and then what what are you guys' height and weight? It depends on the position. I, I really think. okay. It's, uh, it's not. It's not okay. No, that's it's not one size one, one size fit all. I I mean I was a uh, I was a front rower, and um uh, my position particularly was uh, was the um, the hooker. I'm I mean when I was playing I was like five ten probably varying between like 225 and maybe like 235 man, big for big for the ocean man that's good yeah. that's guys <laughs> jeez yeah so it's like i mean yeah in rugby the position wise is it varies because it's also you need tall players you need somewhat short players you need fast players so it's just, it just really depends on the position all right all right yeah, rugby is a very welcoming sport and you know they take anybody all seats and sizes there's a spot for anybody on the team and we'll always welcome new players. Uh, right now, currently myself, I'm at six foot two ten. Um, I can play anywhere in the back, all the way up to a flanker. I've also locked a few times and even propped a few times myself. So I'm a very utility player, as all the coaches have told me. You can, I can, they can put me almost every, anywhere except for a uh, hooker, basically. So, yeah, that's cool. Well, good. Well, one last thing we'd like, because um, I'm sure a lot of people are interested in this sport if they had the opportunity to play it. Starting with you, Tino, what advice would you have for somebody who wants to get involved with rugby? I would say just um, if anyone's curious, just get into it, like find your local club, you know, and then just um, and I think for me it was and for rugby, like the rugby community is so awesome. It's not, they're so nice. It's so welcoming. So just hit you up, hit up your, your um, local club and have at it, especially if it's like a secondary sport. Like for me, it was, you know, after football, I didn't have anything to play. This is nothing, you know, so football was a rug. So rugby was the closest thing to football. And I, you know, I took a chance on it and then it um ended up being pretty good for me, at least travel wise and just meeting all the friends I've got and, you know, and playing, playing some, from high level rugby so yeah i just say get out there really get out there um and if you're just curious just you know join your local you know club for just a practice hmm. and jerry your your advice uh my advice yeah kind of the same thing um if you're not ready to put down the cleats but can't play competitively football anymore try rugby it's a sport i wish i started earlier and you know, the rugby community entirely in the U.S. is very small. So it's a pretty quick way to go pro and even a gateway into as into the Olympics because um, it's such a small community. And the U.S. is direly in need of, you know, high level athletes. So 
it's not just in the law community. We can be anybody. If you're an athlete, yeah, definitely go find your local club and just make connections and definitely take opportunities to excel in the sport that not very many people play in the U.S. Yeah, that's that's great. Hey, have you have either of you watched that movie or heard of that movie Forever Strong? It's a rugby movie. Yeah, yeah. I, I had to watch that this week, and it was it was on like I don't know, it was on uh, a Prime or something. I was like, man, I'd just get a little background of of rugby, right? And it, was, it was pretty cool. It was really good. I mean, I'm I'm big on sports movies where it's always about you know like you know the adversity, the triumph, and all that stuff. So I enjoy that stuff. But that was I watched that just like to kind of get an idea of like what you know what rugby is about it's that's pretty cool it was a really you know it's cool sport it's just growing up in america i barely ever heard of it you know we heard football we heard baseball soccer you know it was always like yeah it was always like an australian sport or, or an english sport but yeah hey yeah. tell us about from either of you tell us about what what is it the chance um is it a polynesian thing or, or a pacific thing that uh, they do these chants during during the games or before the games. Well, can you either of you tell us about that? Uh, so it's the haka. Um, so it's it's uh, obviously a New Zealand thing. That's their thing. Okay. Uh, it's, it's kind of like a a warrior call out. It's what they did before like war, pretty much. It was a way to right. you know terrorize their enemies and also pump themselves up. So uh, they call it the haka challenge, and that's that's what it's there for. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, a lot of the Pacific Islander teams do it. I think Tonga and Samoa also do the Hakas as well, too. So, yeah, there's different teams that do it, but primarily it's uh, the prominent team that does it is uh, New Zealand. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, and on top of that, every every Polynesian country has their own, you know, challenge before the match. They'll do their traditional um, their chance, like, again, like Samoa, Tonga, Fiji will have it, too, as well. So it's just like, you know, psych themselves up. You know, it's inviting the challenge of the other team. It's pretty awesome. Does, the, does Lao have a chant? I mean, Lao, when they come out dancing with Heineken and his oh. <laughs> Right, John? They can have the Heineken and his dance. <laughs> I mean, you know. I'm just, playing, I'm just playing Lao people. I am not saying that all Lao people just sit around and drink Heineken. And, and yeah, sing. I mean. You know, idea in my head, you know, so because obviously, you know, Muay Thai has their pre flight ritual. Yeah, yeah, so right, right. Probably has yeah. the same thing. And yeah, you know, we could probably adopt it in the rugby too if we, you know, really yeah. cool. Well, well, cool. Yeah, I'm going to go check it out now when I'm at the SEA Games in a couple of weeks because Tina was telling me he knows somebody who might be playing on the team. Um, just to, because I've never watched a match. So when I have some downtime between the swimming events, I'll try to pick. Check the loud yeah, team out, yeah. cheer them on. Well, that'd be cool. That'd be cool. Yeah, for sure. And it's one team from every country, right? So you got like Laos, Thailand, Vietnam, yep. Cambodia, yeah, Malaysia, Singapore. Okay. Yeah, every country. If they have an entry, like some sports, the country doesn't have any athletes, then they don't have it. But if assuming they the, the country has a team that's capable of playing, you know, they're there and competing. That's crazy. I, like up to today, I never knew Lao had a rugby team, and and much less a women's rugby team, man. So we, I, we gotta look into that and try to find uh, try to find us a woman uh, rugby player from Laos. Yeah, so I'll, cool. I'll tell you what. If that's at the Sea Games, I am gonna go watch there that. There you go. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be cool. I didn't even no, know it existed. I, yeah, and then there's players oh. on our on our on, our, on my word dragon team has played for the Lao team as well, too. So there's definitely women who are who are living in America who played for Laos as well. So oh, really? Oh, man. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's like there's a That's good amount. Yeah, I think it's two or three of them, or maybe even four. Okay. That's yeah, that's pretty cool. Well, good. Well, hey guys, we thank you for coming on, telling us all about rugby and about your own personal journeys in it. Um, Co, anything else before we wrap up here? No, nah, yeah, man. Thank you for coming on, guys. Like I like I said, man, I, I know very little about rugby, but knowing all this, especially about the Lao team, I I you know I rugby found a new fan because i'm definitely going to start you know start you know trying to learn more about uh you know the Lao rugby team and, and the rugby at uh, the sport in general man but it, it definitely sounds i tell you what man it's like football is easier because you got the pads you know i'm more respect for you guys because there's no pads in this stuff so like the injuries are um you know i'm sure it'd be easier to get hurt so like i i definitely think it, it's a, a tougher sport than 
you know, football's popular and all that, but they got the pads and the helmets and all that, and you guys don't, man. <laughs> yeah, different stuff for sure. Very much different yeah. stuff. So, so Tino, why don't you tell your cousin, AJ Vonquichan, that Co called him a sissy because he puts pads on. Oh, I, I said that. <laughs> I, it. I didn't say that, right? Maybe it's implied. <laughs> I'm just kidding. So I'll, for the I'll, letter, hey, 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 I'll, hey, I'll let him know. AJ, I'll say that. My, I'll say that right now, man. Your cousin Tino is much tougher, man, because he don't, he don't like that. <laughs> but that's also the truth, right? I mean, that's like it's a tougher sport without the. It's your. It's easier to get hurt without the pads. So I mean, it, that's true. Literally, but... you are prepared. You literally are preparing for battle. I mean, broken ribs and broken jaw, right, Tino? Yeah. I mean, Jerry, did you have any injuries? Any injuries? Uh, uh, I've had plenty. Uh, broken fingers, yeah. old hamstring, knees. Yeah. Uh, what else is there? Uh, yeah, yeah, mainly broken fingers and stuff. Stuff. Yeah. Hey, you, uh, guys are, you guys are badasses in my book, man. You and guys then are tough. One, con- one concussion that I know. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, wow. Concussions are a big one. <laughs> well, yeah, you think about football, you get concussions and they have helmets on. Right? Yeah. I mean, they're getting concussions, so. And for the listeners out there, Tino and AJ are cousins. Um, hopefully by the time we publish this episode, AJ's made his choice and is at a new team. But as of the time of recording this, he's going on official visits, finishing out his last year eligibility uh, before the end, he enters the NFL draft. So we are very excited to see where he lands. He had a great career at Utah State. Excited to see where he goes next. So congratulations to your whole athletic family, Tino. Thank you. (laughs) All right. So, everybody, thank you for uh, listening to another episode of C4 Podcast. Uh, My name is Coach Andetka. For my co host, Sean Messina, and our guests, Tino and Jerry, thank you for viewing. And have a great one. Thanks, everybody. The C4 Podcast is brought to you by the Lao American Sports Hall of Fame. Visit us on the web at laoamericansports.com, celebrating the first inspiring the next.